I am pleased to welcome to the table Stephen Samets. Thank you very much for being here today. It's a pleasure. In, in the snow as we tape this. Yes. One of the most respected choral composers in America, composer conductor. Let's talk about a little bit about your foundation in doing what you're doing. You're originally from Westport, Connecticut. When did you first start getting into music? Little kid? <laughs> I started uh, writing when I was six. So I started at a very early age. I wanted to play the piano, I wanted to write. This was an early passion and I had terrific public school music education. I am a poster child for great music education um, and uh, it made me do what I want to do today. Along comes 2013, 2012, and you get commissioned to do something called a child's requiem, probably your title. Yes. You're basing this on hope for Newtown, Connecticut, following the tragedy there. How do you start writing that? Well, it was a very unusual process for me. Normally a composer, I think, uh, hides himself away in his studio or her studio and, you know, thinks great thoughts, is visited by the muse, and emerges sometime later with this, you know, wonderful masterpiece ready for the... The, uh, the performers in the audience. But this was very different. I wanted to reach out across the country and I talked to teachers and administrators and parents uh, and I was trying to get children's responses to tragedy and loss because that is the group most affected at Sandy Hook. We lost 20 children and six administrators. And I got about 500 responses, some of which came from school administrators and teachers, which are also included in the Requiem. So I was trying to give voice to those who had been most affected. Let's look at some of those uh, letters and pictures that you got from children. Here's one of them. They obviously colored a broken heart and wrote to you. We have a few more to look at. Do you remember these as you got them? Families broken apart, children riding in the mouth of babes. Yes, I do remember. And uh, what happened was I collected all of these and they were very impressive. And I thought I would take a really long time to create a libretto out of them. And I was fortunate to get an artist in residency at Yado, which is an artist colony. And it was a stark white studio and I just took all of these writings of children and drawings and I covered the walls. So I was suddenly in this kind of beautiful rainbow colored room with all these children's drawings surrounding me and out of that I just started synthesizing all of these stories and it came into a libretto very quickly uh, reflecting a children's world, the child's world and then I needed to contrast this with the uh, the more complicated, violent world of adults. And for that I used poetry of Emerson and Dickinson and HD and uh, how these worlds collide is really where the piece lives. There's a choral piece to this, is that correct? And you're using students in this? Well, the work is scored for two choirs, a children's choir for obvious reasons, giving voice to the children, and an adult choir. And then there's a, an orchestra um, which is a small core group. Very interestingly, the, all of the instruments in that small group are, are enhanced electronically in some way, and then there's a larger orchestra. All of this is being done by the UConn, uh, the very talented students at UConn, uh, and their orchestra and their choir uh, were part of the whole program that is the commissioning organization. This was the Raymond and Beverly Sackler Music Prize, which is administered at UConn and was designed to be premiered, the, the work is designed to be premiered at UConn on March 5th and repeated on March 7th in Stanford. How long is the work? That's a good question because we haven't really gone through it all, but I think it's about 45 minutes. It includes spoken word, uh, and of course the children's choir has its own very special role in this. There's a soprano solo, a tenor solo, and a, a child solo. So the tenor is a sort of figure of an aggrieved father, uh, alternately kind of uh, trying to come to grips. He's, he's a very complicated character in the piece because he's, he's angry, but he's grieving. Uh, the soprano solo is the mother who is, uh, she has a lullaby for her child at one point. And the treble solo is, is kind of, of course, the voice of the child. 
So there's a lot of layers of this piece, and it's being handled beautifully by Dr. Jamie Spillane and his forces up at UConn. How much pressure did you feel to get this right? Huge. Uh, I, I thought I needed to... My first consideration was to respect and honor the memories of the people and the families most affected at Newtown. And I'm from Westport, so I went up and visited initially and before I started to write a note. And what I was so struck by was I was raised 20 miles away. I was in, in you know, Saugatuck Elementary School in Westport. And it felt just like my hometown when I came back. I haven't lived in Connecticut for 35 years. but You're a professor at Lehigh, I we should say. I'm a professor at Lehigh University in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. And I came back, and it just feels like coming home. It smelled like my hometown. It looked a little like my hometown. And I thought, you know, I could totally relate to what's happening here. But I also realized in a kind of very quick moment that this wasn't specific to Newtown, that this kind of tragedy could happen anywhere. And it opened up the piece in a different way. As I drove out of town, I thought, every time I went past an elementary school, I would gulp. I would just think, this could have happened anywhere. That rocked the entire world, what happened in Newtown. Yes. What is your hope that a child's requiem will do for those who hear it? couple of levels. I, I think it asks a question. It asks, uh, how can we keep our children safe? And it also asks, you know, how can we retain our own childlike quality that we don't want to destroy innocence? It's really a requiem for innocence in some ways. You know, these children, their lives were just suddenly stopped, and, and we have to mourn that. But we also have to ask ourselves how we can keep a world that is safe for children. And for me, if we can offer, if this piece offers any kind of healing through art, it's a success. And if it's asked the question, in the, arts, artists respond to their, their culture. So I have to ask the question, how can we keep people safe? How can we answer these questions about violence? such that the children most affected. And some of them, the, the children who wrote, uh, some of them from the inner city Philly schools, will be at the first performance. And I think just having them present, and they will become artists suddenly, and they live in a culture of violence. And for them to suddenly be transformed this way, I think all of these things come together asking us, how can we elevate ourselves out of this violence to a world where perhaps it's a world of art? Is what we're going to hear after it debuts at UConn, is it a departure from the stuff that you've really written in the past, or is this completely different? Because I have not yet heard it. I've just heard no one little has. smatterings, <laughs> little smatterings of it. Is this a complete departure from what you normally do? Uh, I, would, I would not say it's a complete departure. It's an extended choral work, and I, I kind of am a specialist in writing for choirs. I think that's why I was chosen for this. Uh, but in the sense that it is a large narrative, very dramatic piece with, uh, it, it's interesting because it, it, you can't come into it without some emotional weight already present. Interesting. And uh, if, if somehow the audience meets the piece and the, and the piece connects, I think something extraordinary will arise. Now, you've done this without talking to the folks in Newtown, from what I understand, correct? I, I was in touch with various people in Newtown, mm -hmm. and we have had exchanges, but it was, um, I think, clear that this was going to be something that, that, while given to that community, they're having their own very private of um, process, and I did not want to intrude on that at all. Mm -hmm. um, I'm very respectful of that, and in no way did I want this piece seem to be an imposition. Uh, so, I, it's an offering. That's a that's a lovely way to put this. Um, as a as a kid growing up in Westport, you, you touched on this a little bit that this could happen anywhere. You've written 
this 45 minute long requiem. How did you name it? Was it an easy way to call it a child's requiem? Did that come to you right away or were there other titles that you thought about? No, I think I knew that was going to happen right away. It's, it, it was about the loss of childhood. It's not, it's, it's so much was affected and, and we are all, we all carry our being a child within us. So some part of us dies or has to mourn when any part of childhood is threatened. Well, Stephen Samus, I can't thank you enough for coming here from Lehigh University and we can't wait to hear this. And I hope that it does bring hope to so many communities. As do I. Thank, thank you. you. Spend all night kissing and a bump is right here, then who else is missing? Got a little sidetrack to find my solution. I find a piece of the door, but it's also a metaphor. Things keep locked in the grocery store of the mind. Just the same time, skip right ahead in the nice ride. The harder we look, the less.